Hi, I'm Joseph Lidster and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio and special extra edition of the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. My name is Dwayne, Philip will be with me very shortly, but to introduce this episode I thought I would mention that yes this is an extra episode for the month, it is not a bonus instalment, it's going in our regular podcast list, but we thought it was uh, very important to get this out uh, to you as soon as possible because on the 14th of July this particular piece that we're going to discuss today was released an audiobook reading of James Moran's Doctor Who The Fires of Pompeii Claire Corbett is the reader uh, and it's part of the Target novelization collection and uh, we have uh, a a very in-depth chat coming up with the writer himself James Moran Uh, Some other interesting uh, information about this release. It was produced by Neil Gardner uh, and sound design by David Darlington. So for Big Finish fans, David Darlington is the man behind the 8th Doctor theme. So uh, it's always good to hear uh, David's work. So we're looking very much forward to sharing this interview with you. Uh, Before we get into that, here is a little clip from the audiobook reading and can highly recommend you get this and uh, and have a listen to it uh, but here's a little clip and then we'll be back in a moment with philip along with james moran right vulcan the god of fire which would make that vesuvius i suppose right you are chief donna leaned over to the doctor and tried to mutter as quietly as possible vesuvius as in the great big volcano the one that buried pompeii this Pompeii? The Pompeii we're standing in right now? Yep, said the Doctor. And it's gonna... Sure is. Which means it does. So we should probably... Exactly. Okay then. Okay then. They stood there, staring at Vesuvius, trying to remain calm. Three seconds later, they were running full speed through the streets, back the way they came. Of all the places and times to land, yelled Donna. Millions of years of history, an entire from the different cities, none of which are sitting slap bang next to an active volcano that's about to blow up. Don't tell me, the doctor yelled back. Tell the TARDIS. Sorry, must have pulled us off course. Yeah, probably that stupid thing you never get fixed. I knew you didn't know how to fly that thing properly. How many other bits of it are broken? None, said the doctor. She's in perfect working order. Well, I mean, when you say broken, how are you defining that exactly? For many years, we thought, we Doctor Who fans thought the target books had ended. But recently they've come back with a real flourish and we're getting many new writers to actually start producing their own stories from the new era into target formats. And today we have James Moran, who's just turned his script, The Fires of Pompeii, into a target book. James, welcome. Hello, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, it's, it's great to have you here. Now, how did you first decide to become a writer? Um, I've, I've just always been, I've always done it really since I, since I was a kid, since as long as I can remember, since I was sort of three or four, I was always just writing stories, telling stories, making up silly things or drawing pictures. Um, I would draw those, uh, you know, the way when kids draw the house with the, with the people waving and the smoke coming out the chimney and, and the tree and all that. Um, but mine were always on fire or exploding. <laughs> and that's, that's pretty much been my style ever since. So what was the first professional stuff you started writing in terms of, because you're, you're mainly a script writer, is that, is that how you classify yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think the first, well, technically professional one was, it, it was I won a short film competition um, and the prize was they make your short film um, out, out of your script. So so that was the first time I'd had something actually 
produced and made to a professional level, which was which was just a, a real eye opener. Um, partly because you'd, you'd you'd get on set and there were there were these actual actors you recognise from TV and people who'd worked on people who'd worked on like the Superman movies, the Christopher Reeve Superman movies. The guy, it was uh, the the concept of the short film was uh, it's called Cheap Break Gravity, and the idea is that you have to buy, you have to buy gravity like you would buy phone service and if it runs out then they, they cut off your gravity so so we had to have people up on wires and floating around and the guy doing the wires was like oh yeah i, d- I did the wires for superman and i was like you so you made superman fly and you're doing this ridiculous little short and he's like we just we just keep working it's not you know it's not like a it's not anything special well, it is special but it's not it's just a job you know it's and the the ridiculously talented people you get on your sets to to bring your your silly stories to life so that was that was my first sort of experience of of having something made and it it just it really kind of blew my mind and and I hadn't thought that I would be able to keep it going even then it took someone saying you can probably get an agent and and keep doing this you know and and that sort of that kind of blew my mind as well so so that that was where it started really. I was actually looking at your um, reel for the stories you've done and you've had some amazing actors working on your projects and some of the huge names you've had um, in different shows you've it's done. It's ridiculous. I, I know. And I, I, I'm no one's more surprised than I am. Um, even when they were, when they were in prep for things and they were, they were sort of telling me who they, who they had cast or who they were looking for. It's like, well, they're never going to do this ridiculous nonsense. Why, why, why are you even wait? Why are you wasting your time? And then seeing even for, even for something, something called Cockneys versus zombies and, and, when we were halfway through casting and they were saying, oh yeah, we've got Honor Blackman. I was like, you've what? You've got who? Has she read it? Does she, does she know what it's called? And so they're like, yeah, she's, she's mad up for it. She's, she's really excited. She, she's well up for kicking some zombies heads in and swearing. So. <laughs> but it's, it's like, it's like the, the, the guy to the wires for Superman. It's like, you know, they, they, it's a job. They, they want to keep working and they, and, and they love what they do. So, so why wouldn't they do something, something fun? Yep. So screenwriting-wise, is actually a course that you did? Did you study screenwriting, or did you just learn to do it? No, no. I just sort of uh, picked it up along the way. Um, I'd always been writing short stories as a kid, just prose stories. Um, and then one day, um, uh, I, was, I would always hunt through secondhand shops for, for Target books or film books or storybooks and things. Um, and I found, uh, I found a Time Bandits book, which is one of my favourite films. And, I, and it I think it was I think it was 50p um, and it wasn't until I got it home that I realized it was the script book and I'd never seen the script before and I, and I was like oh this is this is what they write down when they're making a film this is how they 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 describe the action so that they can film it and that was that was when I, I immediately started writing scripts instead, instead of short stories even though I had no way of getting things made I, I had no possible chance but then I had no chance of selling short stories either so I was like well I may as well do scripts and if I'm not selling anything anyway I may as well use this format that I really enjoy because I, I find it much more flexible and and fun um, and you could just get straight to the action um, so yeah so I, just, I just kept doing that and, that and sending stuff out now and again um, and, and getting rejections after rejections after rejections and then and then and then suddenly some, something gets picked up or it gets found and, and then and then you're sort of you're on the way really did you have a particular type of genre that you preferred to write uh, through that whole period of you writing short stories? Oh yeah, uh, uh, sci- uh, sci-fi, action, horror. Um, they they all had, they always had comedic elements as well. I would always put put jokes in. Um, again, I still do that now. I put put way too many jokes in things. So yeah, any anything genre, I, I would I would always gravitate to that. Um, even if, and, and the teachers would sometimes give you story prompts and they would, re- they would really try to sort of rein the class in and, and make sure that no one could possibly misinterpret the prompts to do, to do a sci-fi or a horror, but I would always twist it around into, into a genre tale. <laughs> so how did you come into the circle of Russell T. Davis with Torchwood? I think Torchwood was the first script you wrote for Russell yeah. T. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was it was through my agent. I mean, he he was sort of putting me up for jobs here, there, and everywhere. And I, and I just had a film made, so I was able to sort of get on on desks that I, I probably wouldn't have got on before. Um, and he just he managed to get me a meeting with the script editor and the producer. Um, uh, so it wasn't it wasn't with Russell straight away. It was with them, and 
just chatted about the show and what I liked about it because the first season had just aired um, and just uh, and then and just got to pitch some ideas and and they had I, ha- I had a few ideas and, and they picked one and I ran with that um, as it wasn't I wasn't sort of it wasn't automatic uh, they, they, they had I think they had 16 scripts for 13 episodes and I, I was one of the the extra ones um, so so Luckily, something must have fallen through. Clearly, um, otherwise, I wouldn't have got got mine in. So, yeah. So it's just sort of falling into it, and and bit of luck, bit of good timing, and uh, and and being, you know, having having some decent ideas at the right moment, at the right time. Yep. Now, Sleeper is actually one of my favourite tortured scripts there are. Um, the way that you, you build suspense throughout that. I mean, just the way. Uh, once again, it's, it's almost like a sco- spook script in some way, isn't it? With the terrorism, with the way well, the, the, the Cardiff gets shut down by all these series of explosions. Mm. And the filming of that is just magnificent. I mean, when all those people are blowing up, it is just, you know, so, such a memorable it's, scene. It's bonkers, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was only the, it was the second episode of the series, so they, they, they kept joking that I, I'd blown the budget for everything. So if, if, the, if that had been later in the series, instead of sort of blowing up that phone building, I think that it would have been like a, a gloved hand cutting through a wire. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they, I mean, they threw again. Like it was my it was my first TV thing, so I threw everything into it, including the kitchen sink, just in case I never got another TV job. Um, and they they just really went with it. And I, like like they they said at the time, and they said this on Doctor Who as well. They just said, "Go as big as you want, and we can always pull back." if we need to for the budget or whatever. Um, but if you haven't gone big enough, it's really hard to sort of artificially inflate it. So they so they encourage you to just go completely wild. And oh my God, I, I, I really went for it. <laughs> I just thought, well, I'll put in about five explosions and then maybe I'll get one in. Um, but yeah, they were just like, oh yeah, more more explosions the merrier. It was, it was great. But it was more powerful than just the, the explosions because of the whole emotional heart, the relationship between Gwen and the main character. So the Gwen and the... Hmm. I forget her name, sorry. Um, I mean, that, that has such an emotional heart to it, to Beth. Okay. And then the, the suicide by cop at the end. I mean, it was hmm. such, such an emotionally powerful moment over and over again. Um, hmm. Yeah. So, it, yeah, I think it was a, such a powerful script that way. Now, I assume that's why Russell then chose you for Faz Pompeii. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um... I, it was it was going really well, um, and obviously it was I was I was very enthusiastic and and I, and I would kind of I was I was very very quick. I was I'm a fast typist anyway, but I'm very quick getting getting work back. So when they when they say can you can you do it in can you do it in two weeks? Can you do us a draft in two weeks? And I would I would have a draft in a week because I was just I, obviously I didn't have a child at the time, and I was just I, I wanted to do. As, as good a job as I could so I would just write non-stop all day and all evening until I sort of dropped um so yeah so I think you know I was I was doing a good job and I was very very fast and easy to work with so I think that sort of that really kind of helped swing it I think because it's such a it's such a tight schedule on uh, on all of that once those shows start production the schedule's crazy tight um so on when i got the who job it was it was may and they were filming in september so i i'm convinced that a big part of it is that i was i'm probably the fastest uh the fastest writer around at the time so i i, I, I i'm you know I, I don't mean to you know you got to back yourself and kind of big yourself up but i'm i'm pretty sure that was probably a big a big part of it because they needed it fast I was actually reading in the writer's tale, Russell T. Davis's book, because he talked about the fact that part of the reason he wanted you was yes, you were very fast. Um, mm-hmm. He also commented on the fact, though, that because you were still fairly new to the industry, that you wouldn't get too upset if you reworked some of your stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, c- yeah, completely. And 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 they they they, they did say that like right up front. Um, not so much on Torchwood, um, but on on Who, they said we've had people turn this down. Um, because we have to say up front, you might get rewritten. It might be a few pages. It might be a hundred percent rewrite, um, but he, but he won't take credit, and it'll still be yours, and you'll still be there, and we'll look after you. And but we have to be able to do that for the good of the show. And if and if you don't want to do that, that's absolutely fine. We don't, you know, we don't we don't just assume people w- will be up for that. You don't have to be up for it, but we have to we have to be able to do that. So that's that's. One of, that's pretty much the big condition of it, um, 
and 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 they were right. I, I was, you know, I was quite happy to to join under those conditions because it's it's all and and you you have to do this when you when you write on any show. You you have to just put yourself aside, and it's everything is is in service of the show. You have to you have to put the show first over everything. Great. Now, do, do you remember what the process was in terms of the whole story of the Pfizer Pompeii coming together? Were you given some elements you had to work with? What what were you told to start off with? Yeah, it was. Uh, well, I I thought they'd sort of they'd either ask me to pitch a story from scratch or they would go, here's a full story, go off and do a script. Um, but it was sort of somewhere in between. They said, right, we're, do, we're doing a Pompeii episode. We've wanted to do it for ages. Um, we couldn't afford it. And now we've got access to these Roman sets um, from the TV series Rome that we can use for a couple of days. That will help balance out the cost. We'll build a, we'll build a villa. Um, in, in the studio here in Cardiff to counteract it. So you need X amount of pages on these external streets. Here's some photos that you can use. Uh, X amount of pages in the villa, X amount of pages in the countryside that we'll just do around here and uh, put a filter on and say it's uh, say it's the foothills of Vesuvius or whatever. Um, but, you know, but the, the setting was Pompeii and the, and the villa and, the, and those streets, uh, but there wasn't a story. They were like, we want some sort of fire monster we want a nice Roman family to sort of, so you can see it through their eyes. Otherwise, it's it's too big a scale. Um, and when the volcano erupts, we want some kind of escape pod or spaceship that comes out in the lava. Um, so that so those are the things that we want in it. Off you go. Can we please have an outline by yesterday? Was there any consideration for the fact that Big Finish had done a? stories in the same kind of setting in Pompeii um, or and were you aware yeah. of it and was there any uh, um, consideration I, I wasn't at, I wasn't at the time but the the script had said just to make you aware he said there is there is the big Finnish audio set in Pompeii with the seventh doctor um, he said but don't don't read the script and don't listen to it just in case it it subconsciously influences you um, they didn't want me to sort of accidentally copy something or subconsciously kind of go, oh, I better not do this because it might be a bit similar to that. And so that it would it would kind of limit limit what I wanted to do. So so I didn't so I didn't look at it or, or read up anything about it. Um, and just pure by chance, it turns out that they can both sort of sit comfortably side by side. They don't they actually can. get in the way, which they is a complete accident. Together. Completely yep. accident. But yeah, I'd love to claim credit that I that I did that on purpose, but uh, it was just pure chance. <laughs> Now, back when I was in year seven, I did a Latin course, and Caecilius and Rattel and all those characters were part of it. So, what what made you decide to use the the character names from? I think I think is it the Cambridge Latin course. I think is it, what... it is. Yeah, um, that was uh, Russell did that at school. I didn't. I didn't actually do that at school. I wish I had because um, I did Latin for a couple of years at school, and it was fantastically boring the way we did it. Um, I would have loved to do that to do that course, um, but he he loved that course and that family. And he was always gutted that they just got killed and that was it. So he said, he said, use, use their names, put them in. And he said, we'll send you the book with the translations and everything. Um, didn't expect me to translate the Latin as well. Uh, we'll send you the book um, and let's, and let's, you know, let's rewrite history so that they survived. So, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I did, um, I just had a really boring uh, Latin class uh, at secondary school and I'm not sure what syllabus it was. It was just like here's, you know, here's some verbs and stories about slaves and things, and uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, Latin poetry by Ovid, um, who wrote these long epics about doomed lovers, and they and and they always ended in people dying in fountains of blood, um, and stabbing each other. It was it was quite <laughs> it was quite depressing. Um, but yeah, that was that was that was Russell. He just he was always quite aggrieved that, that they hadn't survived, so he wanted to to change that. I taught my year six class Latin, um, and we used Latin for, for spelling because I, I had an advanced class for a few years. And one of the things we did every year was we did a unit on Pompeii, and we showed the fires of Pompeii to the class um, just to get oh, wow. a bit, just to get a bit <laughs> of an idea of you know, how things look and clothing wise and the things that were going on there. Completely historically accurate, of course. <laughs> I don't know how, how there's a lot actually there's a lot of it is accurate well uh, yeah I, I made I, I made sure it was like as accurate as possible um I had I mean I, I knew I knew quite a bit about Pompeii anyway because it was something I'd been interested in before I ever got this job um so I, I found 
<laughs> I found a timeline, like a like a scientific timeline of exactly what happened and when, and they they put it side by side with the 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 Pliny account of what of what he saw when he went to see it from from the boat, and they sort of matched up the kind of his description with with here's what actually scientifically happened and when. Um, so so I so I used all that, but I just I just compressed it and just made it made it happen a, a lot faster so that you know we couldn't have the episode taking place over several days of uh, of slow slow deaths um so i just i just sped it i just so it's it's in the right order i just sped it up and left out some of the really horrible stuff like, like the people in herculaneum being boiled alive by the air and it was i always that always stuck in my head as something really really awful but you can't you can't put that in a, in a family well, you, tea time show you, you kind of say that for your, the book but we'll talk about that in a second um we um I don't think we covered whether whether you were a Doctor Who fan for a long time uh, before getting the gig. You've always been yes. a Doctor Who fan? Yeah. Again, uh, as long as I can remember, since I was three or four, um, I've always been watching the show. I don't I don't remember what the first one I watched was. I, uh, the first one I remember seeing is the first episode of uh, City of Death. Um, but I, but that, I know that wasn't the first one I saw because I've been, I've been watching it already. So I don't know when I started, but it's it's just been it's been in my life since as long as I can remember. Um, and reading the Target books as a kid as well. That was you know I'd scour the library and the, and the secondhand shops trying to find trying to find one that I hadn't that I hadn't read. Because um, because when I was watching, I was I grew up in the seventies and early eighties. Um, there was no way to to catch up on old old stories apart from reading the books because they didn't repeat them. Not not very often. Um, they certainly wouldn't. Then, you know, there was no, no way to access them the way you can now. Um, it's like it's it's great time to be a Doctor Who fan now because anything that's available, you can you can get hold of it somehow. I I, I don't know. It, there was some something magical about trying to find the Target books uh, back in the day. <laughs> um, I I was thinking as I was listening to to your version of the story in the in the audio novel reading that. There's something about the Doctor Who historical setting that really lends itself to to comedy. I was thinking a lot about the Romans, mm. the Myth Makers, and um, is that something that uh, you were purposefully injecting into this script? Were you, or is that just something? Well, you've yeah. already said that something you do anyway with your writing is inject the comedy, mm. but I think the historical setting works so well for for comedy. It does. I mean, it's. I mean, yeah, it is, it is something that I, I, I automatically do. Um, and have, having Donna in, in your episode, you sort of you, you have automatic license to 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 kind of go for, go for the go for the jokes where you can. And also that she's gonna she's gonna argue with the doctor. Whatever's going on, she will argue with the doctor and, and the doctor will argue right back. So so that's gonna be funny. Um, and I think I think also because I knew I was building to that that awful moment where he has to destroy Pompeii to save the world. Uh, spoilers, um, spoilers. But Pompeii doesn't make it. Um, I knew that I could, I could probably go a bit lighter in the first half, and, and probably needed to, to to sort of balance it out. Otherwise, I think it would have been a bit, a bit too much. Were there many changes to what you originally wrote? Because you obviously wrote it fairly fast. That Russell, when he did his work through, did much change. Um, I did, I did four drafts, four full drafts of the scripts. I did a few drafts of the outlines. Um, I think pretty pretty early on, um, the uh, the thing about the uh, the choice, making the choice of uh, having to save save the world by destroying Pompeii, that that was one of the very earliest things, because um, that was that was the big sort of tricky point. It was like go off and get with the story, and it was like, well, he can't save Pompeii, can he? Because because he didn't. <laughs> So that was kind of the sort of the tricky. So so then figuring out that okay he, maybe maybe he has to let it happen to to save the world, and then it was like oh no maybe he has to make it happen. So there's no eruption going to happen. He has to set it off, and then that and then you kind of go all oh, right now now I know where I can I can work backwards and start it off with everything is different, everything's wrong, and it's not going to happen. And then it's more of a mystery and a, a kind of a, a thing to solve. So yeah, so that that sort of core aspect stayed the same. Um, I think I had I had some more sort of volcanic side effect stuff happening, um, like the, like the the like the noise of the, uh, of the of the grinding rock underneath uh, underneath the ground. Um, there was uh, a scene with a fountain where the waters turned to acid because of the the volcanic activity. 
and it, you know in a tv show obviously you make you make a point once and then then you have to move on you can't you can't sort of have a few separate things but in a novel you, you've got a bit more room to you know just layer in some more of the stuff and kind of kind of slow it slow it down a little bit because you know people can read at their own pace so so you've got you've got a little bit more a little bit more leeway yep so in terms of target you said you, you used to read the target books as a child who who were the authors or what were the books that stood out for you in terms of style Oh, um, Vulnerable Snowman um, was always my favourite. Um, I and it, I, I said to somebody the other day. I, I I couldn't I couldn't actually explain why. I don't know why. I think it was just the atmosphere. Um, like it's not it's not the most visually spectacular story. There's no, you know, it's not kind of filled with explosions and Daleks and things. Um, it's just this kind of sort of quirky, sort of quiet story on the moors in a, in a monastery. Um, but I don't, for some reason, I, I really loved that. I, just, I read that over and over again. I must, I must have bought it to, to read it so many times. Maybe I just kept getting it out of the library. Um, that one, obviously, anything with Daleks, I, that was kind of my first, you know, if, if I had a choice um, between, if there were two available, I would, I would just, I would always go for the Dalek one. Because um, most of them were ones that, I, that I, I'd never seen. You know, there were, there were some, so first Doctor, Second Doctor, Third Doctor ones that I, I would never get to see, and it was I've, I always found it very exotic um, reading some some previous Doctors because there was there was no way I'd get to see them. Although they they repeated some of the Patrick Troughton ones while I was watching Tom Baker growing up, so I did get to see some of those. But yeah, but I, I don't think I saw a John Pertwee until God until until my my late teens. I don't think. Because you, you had to you had to buy the videos if you wanted to watch any of those, and they weren't all available. And you know, I just didn't I didn't have the money didn't have the money for that. So Target we're, Books is where it was at. We were very lucky in Australia because we had them on every night at six thirty or six o'clock. Just <laughs> you know, John Pertwee all the way through Tom Baker, and then just kept cycling backwards over over again. Um, oh, I'd ha- have loved that. I would have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> now, how how were you approached to actually write the novel? How did that come about? I immediately said yes and got very excited, and then I and then sort of about five minutes later, I just had this absolute terror and panic. So I thought, oh god, I've never written a full book before, um, and they're not they're not even as long as like as other books. You know, they're they're quite quick, short reads, um, but just uh, just the the word count it just it just hung over my head, and I was, I was it really freaked me out, um, and knowing that you know unlike a script, every single word I put down people were going to see they would see my my terrible grammar and sentence construction all the bad habits i picked up um so there's nowhere nowhere to hide really um yeah so I, I just kind of panicked a bit and then i thought right i'm just going to go through go through the scripts first go through every old draft and every old outline and if there's anything in there that that could come back in that would kind of help kind of flesh it out and expand it then i'll, I'll copy that in so i did i sort of cobbled together um a big sort of Frankenstein's monster script of the shooting script, and then all all the bits that uh, that were chopped out, and they didn't quite fit because obviously things got rearranged. So I just I just dumped everything in, and then I left it for a bit, and then I came back to it, and and then I just I I literally just I sort of shunted the shunted the script down a little bit, and then started writing the book above it, and as I as I went along, I would I would delete stuff as I went. Just, just purely psychologically, so that when I started writing on that first page, I didn't just have like zero pages <laughs> in the little counter at the bottom. Um, so dumping, dumping the script in, it would help me see where I was going next. And psychologically, it's like, oh, I've done loads of pages already. This is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing really well here. Um, I used, a, I used an online um, word count tracker, which. It lets you put in put in your deadline date. So I picked a deadline a month before the actual deadline to give myself time to to fix the mess I was going to make. Um, and then it, and it says it asks you what days you're not going to be working on, uh, any days that you can do a bit more than other days, and then it gives you a daily a daily word count. Um, so once you plugged it all in, it was like right three three hundred and seventy four words a day, and I and I thought oh that's that's nothing I can do that 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 makes it so much easier, um, and then just don't look at the don't look at the overall word count. So so I just kind of started plugging away and just doing a little bit at the time, um, 
and then it was then it was tricky because in the script obviously you can you can jump back and forth between perspectives willy nilly um but in a novel you have to kind of stick with one person for a bit um and if you're going to switch then you need to sort of separate it into a little separate section you can't just keep doing that over and over in a in a chapter so so just trying just trying to sort of keep the the, the character point of view consistent in each chapter and just pick one person for each section um i think that that was the trickiest and, and remembering that it's not in the present tense like a script it's uh, i was just using third person past tense so yeah it's, it's it sounds really silly and simple but i'm just so used to scripts it was it was really tricky to get my head around it but i really did enjoy the different perspectives you were writing sometimes from the perspective of the mm. doctor and and uh, Donna and what they would be seeing, and sometimes from the other perspective of uh, the family and the fact that they wouldn't comprehend certain things. I was really enjoying mm. that aspect too. So in in a way, you were doing, you were doing that, but uh, it was it was very enjoyable the way you did it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, I had to yeah, I had to rearrange some stuff. Um, I think I, I think the the editor's thing was just. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it too much, or within or within one section. I had to like if I was going to switch perspectives, then I had to had to start a new section or a new chapter. So one thing I love about what you do with the novel is the, all the um, Latin titles for every chapter. Um, what made you think about doing that? Oh, that was that was one of the early things I did again before I sort of started writing properly. I think I'd done about a page, and I was still still just trying to get my head around it, and just kind of trying to stop freaking out. Um, and I just thought, I'll, I'll, what if, what if I, what if I call uh, uh, the first chapter by with, with like I'll use I'll pick a Latin phrase or something. And I thought I could do that for every chapter. I'll pick some some sort of well known Latin phrases um, and and do that on every single chapter. And then I'll I'll put like a little kind of a, like an old sort of Roman font on it um just to kind of just to kind of get it was just mainly to just get me in the mood of like here's here's a this is a target book just like the ones that you read as a kid and let's try and kind of get into that zone of exciting target book with the cliffhanger at the end of every chapter um and i even uh i was typing it in word i i i reformatted the page so that it was pretty much the same page size as the target book so that when I finished the page, I would see that I'd finished the target page rather than just, you know, doing like a big A4 page and not knowing how much I'd done. So it was just, just to kind of trick myself into, into getting into, getting into that zone. Um, so it was just for me really. Um, and then I, then I hoped other people would be amused by it. That's kind of what I do with, with most of my work. I just was what, what interests or amuses or scares me. And then hopefully other people will, will come along for the ride. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in terms of commissioning, so when was it commissioned? How long did, it, did they give you to actually write the thing? And how long has it been done for? Because like, how long does it actually take to publish a work, to get the audio book recorded, all those things to happen? Blimey. Um, Do you know any time scale? I think scale? it was, I think, I think it was, I think it was sort of June last year that I got the gig. I'd have to double check. It was June or July. Um, and I think they needed the draft by early December or something like that. Um, so, so I, so I put in a deadline of, um, early November into my little, my, my, my word count tracker just to make sure that at the end I'd have a, I'd have a month to, to tidy up anything too awful. <laughs> so yeah, so June, June or July, I think, um, but I was, I was writing something else at the time, so I, I couldn't start immediately. So I think, so I think I wrote it uh, from August to November. Just counting on my, literally counting on my fingers. So I think that was four months, um, which is probably probably too long for 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 quite a short novel. Um, but I, I had never done a full one before, so it took me longer than I, I was saying. I've got loads of friends who are authors, and and, and I was sort of complaining to them. Oh, it's so difficult. It's so many words, and and they were just like. My last novel was one hundred and sixty thousand words. You, you've basically written like three chapters of my novel, so you know, just you know. <laughs> how, many, how many words were you told had to be? Um, they're about thirty-five thousand words, which, you know, for 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 normal novels, I think 
that would be that would be way too short so so it was nothing but like any 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 proper authors uh hearing this are just gonna be scoffing at how how amateurish uh I, no, I suspect, um, I suspect was, all proper authors will be jealous by the fact that you've got to write a target book and they haven't. Well, that that's, that that's, that probably doesn't help either. Yeah. Um, so, and you're complaining about it, and it's only thirty five thousand words. What's the matter with you? <laughs> Sounds great. Um, can I say once again, you, the way you've injected humour throughout it is I loved. I mean, there's a description about Calculus's house that it bordered on tasteful in Las Vegas, which I just thought was. <laughs> Lovely description. There's a whole discussion about the Doctor changing time. Actually, I love how you talk about the Cockney too, in terms of, you know, what mm. Donna says why, you know, because this whole Cockney accent in the TV show, and you give an explanation about the TARDIS translator circuits mm. changing accent, regional accents, so that you can actually understand the context. So, in terms of those, th- did they just come to you in terms of that you just wanted to add those things in, or you know, as you add a bit of more TARDIS lore? How did that happen to you? Yeah, when I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a diehard Doctor Who fan. So part and parcel of being a Doctor Who fan is explaining your own head canon as to things that don't quite make sense, um, and especially if it if it's your own episode, you know, little kind of small nerdy things that if someone kind of questions you on it, you go, well, actually, I have thought about it, and I have a whole big long boring explanation I can give you because I had because I had to make it make sense to me before I could write it down. Even if I even if if I don't put it on the page, um, so yeah. So the the Courtney thing, I think I think that was that was a someone had done a review, and I, I was just I, I used to read all the reviews at the time, uh, which was foolish. Um, somebody had done a review going, oh, a nice thing about the TARDIS translation circus doesn't quite explain why he sounds Cockney though, does it? And I just thought, well, well, of course they're going to sound they're going to they're not. He's not going to sound Latin, is he? He's not going to. What's Lovely. what's the Latin accent? Yeah, so I just thought, well, I, and then in my head, I thought, well, it probably, if it translates the, the language to your language and it translates slang as well, uh, like, you know, people, people in Asian Rome didn't say blimey, but they probably said something along those lines. And that, and so the translation circuits would change it to blimey. And I thought, well, that probably, it probably the same for accents as well. If, uh, you know, if, if you, if you met a market trader in London, you would probably expect them to sound cockney. So, so in Donna's head, a local market trader would probably sound cockney, so the translations for kits would do that for her to kind of just make it sound believable. And 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 people like uh, like uh, Phil Davis's character, they they would sound a bit more haughty and and posh and patrician and 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 that's all the trans. I you know I I've, I've just kind of decided that's how it worked. So uh, so I don't I don't think anyone has explained the accent thing before. So so they're probably going to have to go along with my explanation now. No, I don't think anyone has ever explained it before. And it, it made so much sense. It was perfect. Um, <laughs> now, now you, you haven't had a chance to listen. We, we've had a chance to listen to this so far. So Claire Corbett did the um, mm. reading. And it, it, it is it's a spectacular reading. I was so impressed by how well she read it all. Um, and yeah, she she does, done, she's done so many of them. Yeah, she's great. Yes, I actually, I actually looked her up in terms of she's. I think she's one of the top winning authors of uh, readers for yeah, audible she, books. Yeah, she's she's audiobook narrator royalty, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so do, you, do you know? Do you know how you got her? No idea. Um, was because when they were when I was getting close to the deadline, they were they were kind of saying, "Oh, well, you know, there'll be there'll be this this stage and that stage and the proofing stage. And then we need to get it off to the uh, yeah. to the to the studio for the That's audio recording." Cool. And, and I went, "Oh, is there an audio recording?" I said, "Yeah, we do we do it for all of these." Um, and they didn't know who who was going to be doing it at the time because it's not always clear. Um, so so I didn't know who's going to be. And then and then when they finally said it had been it was done. And and I said, oh oh, so who was it then? <laughs> and they told me who it was. Um, so it, yeah, it, so that was just all sort of happening in the background. Um, and I was just like, God, I hope I've hope I've not left in some sort of terrible, terrible typo that's gonna that's gonna trip her up. I'm sure she would have dealt with it. <laughs> Someone must do an edit of the book after you visit, though, don't they? Someone do an edit and give you give you notes so they don't yeah, bother. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had I had well, I had uh, I, I sent my draft in, and then then the editor would come back with some notes, uh, most of which were about anything I'd, I'd any sort of typos or um, it was mostly the character POV thing. Um, they were like they were like right, you've told this chapter just from one character's point of view, but suddenly in this paragraph you suddenly explain what someone else is thinking, and then you go straight back to the other character. So just things like that was because it, it, it's not my natural uh, my natural medium um so just kind of fixing things like that and again and 
it was about halfway through I, I did a big I had to stop and did a big rejig of some of some chapters I'd already written um because in in the in the the tv episode they are there in the street we see the soothsayer and then the soothsayer runs off and then we have a scene with the soothsayer and then we come back to them and on, but on the page it just didn't it didn't make any sense to do it that way it just didn't didn't work at all um in novel format so i had to just take that out kind of show show that she was in the background and then come to her later and then have a whole chapter um and kind of and then and then kind of go back to back to the action just things like that and then yeah so i did i did i had some notes from the editor and i, I fixed those and i think i had I had one more set of notes which i addressed and then they uh, they got a proofreader in um who said he didn't he didn't really find very much just a few just a few typos here and there um yeah it was most it was mostly that and taking i, I think i had about a thousand uh, more commas than i should have had so <laughs> just strip, stripping out some commas I think listening to the audiobook being read, one of the, the scenes that struck me, which wasn't part of the TV show, was there's a conversation between the Doctor and Donna where she starts talking about the fact that um, a problem shared is a problem, and of course the saying is halved, and she go change it to two people being miserable, um, <laughs> which at the time amused me and I thought was actually very interesting. But then I realised you, you used that really powerfully to foreshadow what was going to happen at the end of the novel in terms of the choice Donna and the Doctor made. And and one of the things that I don't think that well I think they tried to show really well the TV show but you were able to bring out in the novel was the power the, the choice they both had to make and the fact that Donna is sharing the Doctor's choice and pain um, and I guess because mm. you foreshadowed throughout the novel how how she's trying to save Pompeii and then suddenly at the end no she's destroying it as well yeah I mean that that the the problem shared thing that was just like that was just a standalone joke at the time and then when I got to that bit at the end. I remembered I remembered writing that bit, so I went back and kind of just made it a little bit more more heavy handed of uh, of just I mean that that's the good thing about, about scripts and books is that if once I if I see something that that that, that works like that, I can go back and, and, and layer it in more. So it just makes me look a bit more clever than I actually am. <laughs> I really enjoyed the reference in the book. I can't remember if it was in the TV show. I don't think it was, but the reference to the Pink Floyd concert uh, in Pompeii, one of the oh, best no, concerts no, that's no, no. ever been. Uh, amazing. I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan. Yeah, I love that, love yeah. that concert. Yeah. It's a shame that, sorry, that reference I'm, didn't get in the TV series, but it was it was good to be I didn't think It, it made me smile. I didn't think of it at the time. Um, it was just when I was just writing the book and had had more kind of time with my own thoughts, That's and then, then I, I suddenly thought, "Oh, I can I can whack in a whack in a Pink Floyd." I'm not sure Donna would be a Pink Floyd fan at all, um, but I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan, so I, I was like, I, "I can I can shove that in for my own amusement. No one's gonna no one's gonna complain." She she would have had a boyfriend who loved it at one point. <laughs> yeah, he would have bored her to death. That's um, right. <laughs> trying to trying to make her understand. You've got to no, you've got to listen to this bit. <laughs> you've got to watch Echoes for every second of it. Yeah. <laughs> that, and that's that's me. <laughs> well, you did you did the three bad things that happened to Donna in the last twelve months, and those they were hilarious. <laughs> as you're just listing the the other bad things, yeah. You know, which yeah yeah anyhow, read it or listen to it because it's worth worth it just for that that scene too. Okay, so the other thing I thought that you did really well in terms of building tension was the chapter, which is just one sentence, but mm. it's all you need. And once again, how that's read in the on the audio. Um, it really makes the, the climax and just builds tension beautifully. I, I think I think that's going to make me cry when I hear it. Um, so I, I rewatched the episode obviously a couple of times before before starting this just to kind of get get back in the the flow of it. Uh, it honestly it make it makes me cry every single time. Not because of any skill that I brought to it, but it's purely Donna's performance in in that moment. It always just makes me cry, I and mean, it's I, I can feel the back of my neck starting to tingle a little bit because I'm thinking about it. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure that uh, when Claire gets to that bit in the book, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop a pop a few pop a few salty tears out of my face. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very very powerful. So the other thing I thought thought was really lovely, which you can do in hindsight, is um, the Doctor commenting on Carcillus's face and what a strong positive face. I, yeah. I, I like a nice face. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, foreshadowing <laughs> the effect. And that, that was just yeah, a, a nice touch for what's going to happen in the future. Well, not, the nice thing is that uh, Stephen Moffat, who was much cleverer than I am, came up with a really great explanation for it uh, and sort of retract, retconned the uh, the face thing. So I was able to just, uh, I just went, oh, I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just steal that and and, uh, and put it in this. 
um i didn't i didn't ask if i could i i just did it without thinking and then it's only it was only when it when it had gone to press and it was too late i thought i probably should have asked if that's okay in case he's going to write a book about that moment later on um but oh well i'll apologize later <laughs> <laughs> so since writing um fires of pompeii what, what, what's your yeah what, what have you done since what are you looking forward to doing in the future um, I'm, I, I can never escape the world of Doctor Who, and not nor would I want to. So I've done, I've been doing a few audios um, for for some for some doctors. Um, obviously, they're for the big finish because it, you know who who else is doing <laughs> doing audios. Um, although there is a, a brilliant uh, new show called Redacted, um, which I'm, I don't know if you were able to access it uh, in Australia, but. Uh, but that's that's done really really well, um, and there's a great writer on that, uh, Juno Dawson. Um, but yeah, but my my audios have been for for Big Finish, and um, I can't, they're, they've not been announced, so I, ca- I can't I can't say what they are. Um, but yeah, I was trying to sort of keep it quiet when I when I originally said oh, I'm doing some audio, and I was like Big Finish, I was like I can't really say it, and I was like, well, who else is it going to be for? Who who else is doing <laughs> doing it? <laughs> Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Torchwood. Serenity. Oh, boy, it sure is good to be home. Evening, Bob. Evening, Ken. Evening, Mary. Evening, Ken. Beautiful day, isn't it? Oh, it certainly is, but not half as beautiful as your hair today. How do you do it? Oh, you charmer. Guilty as charged. <laughs> Front lawn's looking good. Well, not as good as yours, but may the best man win. Thank you. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Evening, Ken. Evening, Vanessa. What's that lovely Evan cooking up for you tonight? Oh, I have no idea. He likes to surprise me. Oh, I bet he does. Okay, then. <laughs> See you around, guys. Catch you later. Don't be a stranger. Ooh. Honey, I'm home! You're a sight for sore eyes. Oh, mwah. <laughs> You're not so bad yourself, hey? What's for dinner? Big finish. We love stories. I can't just let them wipe out the human race. I have to end it! You did the Torchwood Big Finish story, Serenity, with, with John Barrowman and Gareth David Lloyd. How did that, how did that come about? I did, yes. Um, I got I got an email from uh, James Goss, who uh, who was who was running things. Um, I it with just a subject line: "How much do you miss Torchwood?" And I just thought, I know what this is about, and and I'm in. <laughs> so uh, he just asked if I wanted to do uh, an audio, and did I have any ideas? And I just said, yes, I would love to come back and do some more Torchwood. Um, and in fact. I want to come back and bring the bring the sleepers back uh, if I possibly can. So, uh, so they were they were well up. I had a few ideas, and that was one of them, uh, and they were well up for that. So they combined that with one of the other ideas. Um, so yeah, I was just I was very excited to do that and just get as many jokes in as possible. Well, it, it was it was almost like a sitcom with Jack and Yanto, you know, living in a house. Pretty together. much, it was, yeah. It was it was the sit the total sitcom. Yeah, yeah. Even by the time the threat sort of came out, by the end, I'm not sure anybody was actually really uh, that, that bothered or scared. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was it was one of the most ridiculous things I've ever I've ever written. Um, but but I, you, I think you kind of had to go once you have Jack and Yanto undercover wearing sort of Hawaiian shirts and, and going to fondue parties. I, th- I think you've you've gone you've you've crossed a certain line, and you can't really suddenly then make it really scary. <laughs> Did, did you manage to go for the film the recording of that? Yeah, yeah, I was there. Uh, I was there for. Um, I think they did it all in one day. Uh, I was there for the full day. Um, just got to hang out with them and, and hear that it was. They were they were so funny. That just the way they were delivering the lines. Again, it's it's never that you know I'm laughing. I do laugh at my own jokes, but it's mostly I'm, I laugh at the performance and and how they how they put a spin on a joke. And it always cracks me up. And they always throw in something that they that they've made up that's that's funnier than anything I've done, which is really annoying. Um, yeah, so it, it was great. I got to do a few sort of background voices on that as well, because um, anytime anyone's in the studio, they just get them to be like a crowd noise, because you know, because they don't they don't uh, 
they don't have massive budgets so they're just like how you know let's let's use you because you're here and you're free <laughs> oh, so is that the first time you worked with scott hancock or did you know him from when he was working at bbc wales um no i, well, I knew him from uh i knew him from um big finish before um i don't he wasn't he wasn't in my one uh I, I did a highlander audio um which i think uh ken i think ken bentley did that um but i'd, I'd met scott several times on uh, on various occasions of various things so so I, I i knew him already um but i knew he was you know he's their sort of he's their expert director and so yeah i just i just got there and he, it was already underway and he was just cracking through it and and really professional and i i didn't have to i wasn't there to oversee it i was just there to watch and, and join in and have some fun um because they you know they, they run a very a very smooth tight ship there and they know what they're doing so yeah i was just it was just like i don't have to worry that they they're, they're they're doing doing an amazing job and uh i got to be i think i got to play dave at the barbecue um i'm the, I'm the spit roast man Oh, right. <laughs> and so had you got to meet, had you, had you met David Lloyd, Gareth Lloyd and um, John Barrowman doing Torchwood Sleepers and also True of Earth? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I was on set for both of those um, and and I sort of, you know, hung out. Uh, I went I went, to, went to Cardiff to, to be on set, so I got to hang out at the read-through and the tone meeting and sort of chatting on set and stuff. Um, I got to be got to be friendly with, uh, with Gareth afterwards as well and... Uh, he did a he did a, a web series that that I wrote and, and part directed. Um, where I got to do, again, I got to do terrible things to him again. Um, he's just he's just so e- he's just so easy to torture, and he he does he does it he does it so well. I can't I can't resist it. I have to I'll have to get him in something else again than just torture him or maim him or kill him or something. Just uh, I just enjoy it. He's just so talented and good looking. I just I have to I have to hurt him. <laughs> Listen, James. So thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. We've um, loved what you've done, and we look forward to there's um, more stuff coming. So we look forward to hearing that as well. Yeah, yeah, and other other things I haven't even haven't haven't even remembered to mention. But yeah, there's there's lots of things happening probably next year. But uh, yeah, things in the pipeline. So it's a good it's a good time. It's been, it's been a quiet pandemic, but things are things are back on track now. Hopefully. This has been The Sirens of Audio, episode 119, with our guest James Moran on his novelisation of The Fires of Pompeii, with your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Contact us or check out all our details at sirensofaudio.com. You can email us at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or post a comment on our socials or our YouTube channel. Let us know your thoughts on this or any one of our episodes. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.